broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Irene Barley, the Director of Education for the Dibble Institute. And accompanying today, me today is Kay, who is our webinar organizer. Hi, Kay. Hi, Irene. Great. Uh, good to know the organizer is there. Today's topic is turning Mike's bad day into a good day, relationship skills for students with autism and learning disabilities with Nancy Noel. Before we begin, I'd like to point out a few housekeeping tips. If you experience audio difficulties during this broadcast, please note the phone number listed here or on the link in your email connecting you to this webinar. You can both listen on the phone while viewing the broadcast on your computer. And I have to warn you that we are aware of occasional transmission static. And um, if you were just there with us during the webinar, it will come in and out every now and then. If you're not missing any words or anything, it just uh, kind of delays the transmission. It's not your computer. We invite your participation today, and that can be done in several ways. Nancy will be asking polling questions that you can answer directly on your screen when that screen comes up. And she will also ask you to raise your hand. Now, to raise your hand, if you look at your control panel at the very top, there are icons that have a hand icon. You would look at that. It's at the very top of your control panel. And clicking on that indicates that you're raising your hand. And we can see that. And we'll know that you did. Your questions and comments can be entered through the question box on your control panel. We will have 10 to 15 minutes Q&A at the end of the presentation. And if your question isn't answered or addressed during the Q&A, it will be answered privately through email or as a reply directly to you in the question box. OK. The Dibble Institute is a secular national nonprofit organization dedicated to equipping young people with the skills and knowledge they need to develop healthy, romantic relationships now and for their future. Charlie Dibble, our founder, was an aeronautical engineer who in his retirement years was dedicated to working with young people. In doing so, he became well aware of the emotional challenges to their long-term well-being. This became most evident when in the early 90s at his grandniece's wedding, he heard her say, oh, Uncle Charlie, this is just my first wedding. Now, you have to realize this was the time when the divorce rate was reaching its peak, and this response very much concerned Charlie. He had heard many painful stories from the youth he worked with following their own parents' relationship issues. Charlie was very much concerned with the decreasing models of healthy relationships teens had to emulate. To make a long story short, Charlie quickly realized little was being done to address the development of skills needed to form healthy, successful relationships. In 1996, with the cooperation of fellow business colleagues, educators, and friends, he founded the Dibble Fund, now known as the Dibble Institute. Charlie's vision was to have accurate, unbiased, timely research-based resources available for you. We pride ourselves in remaining true to Charlie's vision. And in keeping with that vision, I'm so happy today to introduce our presenter, Nancy Noel. After working with children, adolescents, and adults with disabilities for 30 years and seeing the high incidence of sexual abuse they experienced, Nancy went back to school to complete her master's in sexuality education. Since then, she has worked hard addressing the unmet need for sexuality and relationship education. Over the last 10 years, Nancy has taught hundreds of adolescents and adults about relationship skills, sexual abuse prevention, sexual health, and establishing healthy boundaries. 
has developed best practice models of care for people with disabilities who are victims of sexual abuse and who have problematic sexual behavior or are sex offenders. In 2007, the Society for Scientific Study of Sexuality recognized her work by awarding her their Emerging Professional Award. I personally welcome her as a new author for the Dibble Institute and to this webinar. Nancy, welcome, welcome. Thank you. We ready to go? Here we go. Ready to go. All right. Almost. There we go. Okay, we're ready. Um, as you heard, my name is Nancy Noel, and I'm going to talk today about helping adolescents um, spend, learn how to have healthy um, friendship and romantic relationships um, throughout their middle and high school years. So today we're going to talk about some practical solutions to common middle school and high school peer friendship and romantic relationship concerns when teaching students on the autism spectrum or have intellectual disabilities. I've been teaching uh, both groups of kids for um, adolescents, middle and high school for about 10 years. Um, I just need to say at the beginning, these are complex issues and we have a short amount of time. So I'm going to get as much information out there to you as I can and um, if you have, I really look forward to your questions at the end if you still um, have some things you need to know. So today we're, I'm going to describe three common problems that special education students have, identify three approaches that can be used to address these problems, and provide you some uh, educational activities that you can use with the students that you're working with. Um, I'm going to, I do work with adults, but today the focus of everything is going to be what is basically school-based or adolescent relationship-based um, relationships. So. I'm going to ask you guys, why is it important to teach relationship skills? This is our first question. And we have that up, Nancy, now. You do? Uh, Good. There is, yes, and if they, they have a selection of four answers. So if everyone would uh, select one or more of the answers on the screen. How are we doing, Kay? 30%, 35%, 44%. We're getting close to 50% voting. People are still, still coming in. So let's wait a couple more seconds. OK, we're going to close the poll with 77% voting. And let me show you the results. Nancy, 88% believe that uh, we, we should do this because young people don't understand the subtleties of relationships, 79 because they are at risk for sexual abuse, 52% um, because they don't have relationship skills by middle school, and 67% because they do not have good boundaries. Well, you're all right, because all of those issues are extremely important um, for kids to learn. and. Some, skill, some of those issues are more or less important for individual students, but they all are real, a real part of their life in middle school and high school. This happened to me last time. Okay, so because of this, I want to talk a little bit about um, sexual abuse that's been mentioned before. Um, when I started um, doing this work was when I was working with a group of self-advocates um, who have intellectual disabilities and as I got to know them as a volunteer and spent time with them, they, they disclosed to me histories of sexual abuse. And over time, a hundred percent of the men and the women that I was working with disclosed that they had been sexually abused at some point in their life. This is a big deal. 
But I was really surprised that not many people around me ha were really interested in that and, you know, didn't really want to do much about it or didn't know what to do. Um, and the research also shows that 99, 97% abuse of abusers are known to the people that they abuse. So this is an issue. Um, so because of all this, I decided I needed to go back to graduate school and I wanted to learn how to deal with this. When I started teaching, uh, teaching kids on the spectrum, one of the first things that happened was I was asked to help with situations where different teenagers were uh, coming in contact with the criminal justice system. And they ha were being arrested because they're making social mistakes, not because they were true offenders, but because they were really not understanding the social environment around them. So it, this is really important. Is why I spent a lot of time specifically working with kids on the spectrum, trying to give them the skills and information they need to stay safe. With with all of the kids that I work with, I, I really want people to think about what, what do these teenagers need to know when they're 25, 30, or 35 years old. I'm going to be telling stories throughout this talk because I think the stories are helpful and illustrate a lot of the, the issues that I've had to deal with. And this is a, this is a pretty sad story. Um, a colleague of mine was working with a young man in his 20s who was on the autism spectrum. And he had downloaded um, six minutes of kiddie porn. Now I don't know if that was accidental on purpose. A lot of times uh, people get on those sites by accident, but no, nonetheless he downloaded six minutes. Well the FBI caught him and what I learned is that every every image, every frame of a movie is one felony count. So this 25 year old was charged with over 6,000 felony counts of child pornography. He also, this is a while ago, had Napster on his computer, so they also charged him with distributing child pornography. He's in jail for 20 years. This is one reason I do this work, because I think that we can keep, keep people safe and keep them um, learning about how to be in healthy relationships. Okay, what do my teenagers want? They want to be like every other kid in high school. They want to go to dances, they want to go to proms, they want to have friends on Facebook, hang out with their friends, and most of all they want to have a girlfriend or boyfriend. What do parents want? One of the things when I work with students in uh, public schools is I tell the parents if you don't feel comfortable with me to teaching your, your child, I, won't, I shouldn't be teaching them. So I do spend a lot of time talking to parents about um, what I'm teaching, why I'm teaching, and how I'm teaching it. Um, they want to protect their child and they, they really do struggle at times with how to best support them. Parents are often nervous, afraid, and unsure because they, they know in their gut the, the statistics about um, sexual abuse and they worry about it a lot. Teachers. Um, teach, the teachers I work with are fabulous. I learn from them every single day. Um, and they really have identified many of these problems, but they do feel overwhelmed at times in terms of what to do. And most often the teachers that I work with feel that they, they're afraid they're going to do something wrong. And so that really makes them um, hesitant to do anything in terms of teaching um, some of these uh, skills because they're really not confident that they're going to be teaching um, the right information. So this has been what I think the approach has been up until now with kids with disabilities or are on the autism spectrum. If you're unhappy for any reason, we'll feel really bad. And I think that most people that work with them, they do feel really bad. They know this is a huge issue. They know these kids are lonely and they feel really bad about it. But now I think there are things that we can do to help them. The first thing is to not perceive them as children. We need to look at them as young adults. They need to start learning skills two, three, four years before they're going to actually have to use all of them because it takes a while to teach this information. So we need to be planning for um, what their future looks like and what they need to learn in their future. Another issue I run into is when I get involved with a, a person when they're 18, 19, 20 years old and they've already learned problematic sexual behavior or problematic re behavior around relationships, 
because nobody gave them, um, and there isn't a lot out there, specific information. So what happens then is you have to, un you have to unlearn and then relearn new skills. And I think it's, the skills are important, and I think you can teach them at a developmentally appropriate time so you don't have to deal with that issue. I'm going to talk about theory of mind for a minute. Theory of mind is really important for kids that are on the autism spectrum. Um, and they believe that everyone is thinking the same thing that they're thinking. Well, in terms of relationships, that can get you into trouble pretty quickly. So if you're thinking oh, this girl's really looking pretty hot and she feels the same way about you and she really isn't, that can cause serious problems. One of the most um, stark examples I, I have had of this was really um, amazing. I, start, I was in school one morning and the, this pile of boys come into my class. They're all excited because one of their friends had found a girlfriend and they were so excited that one of them finally had a girlfriend. So I said, okay, what happened? Well, they, uh, this family was Catholic and they were going to church on Ash Wednesday and they decided to go to the cathedral downtown to make it sp something special. So as they're walking into the cathedral, the high school students from the Catholic schools nearby were at the church and they were wel welcoming people to come in. So as they walked into the church, there was a high school girl that welcomed my student. To come to, she said, welcome to our church. And then they went into the service. And that was it. That's all she said to him. And when, so when he told me the story, I kind of walked it back and said, well, do you think you're going to be a girlfriend and boyfriend? Do you think you're going to go out on dates? And they all agreed that they were going to be boyfriend and girlfriend, that they're going to go out on dates. They weren't really sure if they get married, though. So, we had to take a hard look at what had actually happened, and was this realistic that this might happen, and, and it's just not going to happen. So, I think that that was an amazing um, example of theory of mind. Um, in the educational program that I run, there are some um, specific things that are part of it. We have group rules. Um, that everything we talk about in the class must be private. Um, as most people know, if a student dis uh, discloses abuse, I have to report it. Um, and th and that has happened. I teach lessons every year in the spring about um, sexual abuse risk reduction. And a number of years ago, people were very concerned about one of the girls I was teaching, and they asked me to sit with her and talk because of some of the behaviors she was um, exhibiting. And everybody kind of thought it was her brother. Her brother had a lot of problems. They thought he may be touching her or do something uh, inappropriate sexually. Well, after talking to her, what, I, what she told me is that her grandparents live in New Jersey, and she went to visit them every other weekend because that's where their father lived. And when she got there, she would sleep with the grandfather, and the grandmother would sleep on the sofa. We made a difference in this child's life. We were able to stop the visits to um, the grandparents' house. Um, we supported the family and gave them information and actually she's in high school now and she's doing really well. I teach students from age 11 to 21 and I teach them based on their abilities, their age, and their knowledge. Um, most of the students I teach are fairly verbal. I do have a couple of kids on the spectrum that have limited verbal skills who are autistic. And I have one student that uses the iPad to talk. Um, I have emotional learning support students in my class, uh, life skills kids, and I have um, students with Asperger's who have normal or above normal IQs. Um, I teach the same general topics every year, but the content changes depending on how old they are and um, where they are and what they need to learn. I teach, I don't teach information that they don't need yet. So often we may have but I may have a class of kids where some kids know a lot of stuff and other kids don't. And rather than, ex because I also teach sexuality education, um, I don't expose the younger kids or the kids that have less information to that. We, I make the group smaller. Um, the teachers in the room when I teach, I think that's really um, an important thing because there may be things we talk about that the teacher knows that any given uh, student has some issues with and she can offer some examples. If there's some confusion about what I'm doing in the class, she can explain it to the teachers because she was in the room. And a lot of the teachers write a little note home to all the parents to just let them know what we've talked about. I teach in each classroom once or twice a month for an hour. Um, 
in one of those situations, we were practicing calling people on the phone and inviting people over to your house to hang out or watch a movie or have pizza. And while we were role playing this this um, interaction out, one of the things we learned is that one of the students in the class who was brilliant in math, brilliant in science, incredibly smart, had never answered the phone. In his own home, he does not answer the phone. That's a pretty big deal if you're going to maintain relationships with friends and other people in the world if you don't know how to talk on the phone or answer the phone. We don't know what they don't know. And that's what's so why it's so important to keep asking questions because a lot of times you're really surprised at, at what it is they don't know. So these are the topics I cover in a given year. Um, and the reason I put it up like that is um, a few weeks ago, one of the girls that I teach um, decided to talk about something that had just happened to her. Um, and you see on the slide, she had gone over to a girlfriend's house. She was in high school. She'd gone over to her girlfriend's house. The parents went home, and they decided they were going to drink. Well, she was drinking glasses full of hard liquor. So she got pretty drunk with her girlfriend. Then her boyfriend arrived, and she passed out, and her boyfriend raped her. Then she got up, still no parents, nobody else was involved. She fell and hit her head on um, the toilet or something in the bathroom and had a seizure. At that point, they called the ambulance, they called the police. She, she disclosed to the kids in my group that she had had two seizures and she almost died. That's the first time that's ever happened to a student that I've been with. But the point is that... It, this is real. They they do things that other students do. They have issues in their lives that are the same as other students. And if you look at the things that I teach, almost every one of them is a necessary component of dealing with that the scenario that I I outlined. And uh, um, but the reason she talked about in group is she really wanted that, that no one else would make those same mistakes again. And um, and she trusted the group and the way we handle information that she felt safe enough to talk about it. So that felt pretty good, even though I was pretty scared she almost died. I use a wide range of interactive teaching methods um, depending on the topic and the abilities of students. Um, I use a lot of video. We'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I use, um, I've made up games. We um, do a lot of role playing. We play charades. As much Thing, as many things that I can think of that will actually have them practice the skills that we're using. A lot of students don't want to do this because it's hard. It's hard for them to get up and um, practice saying hi to a girl when they're really nervous. Um, practice um, figuring out how to get with their friends to go out and, and get something to eat. So, what to teach. Um, Ten years ago when I started teaching, I sat, I was, sat down with my first group of students and told them that um, I was a sexuality educator and that I was here to answer their questions they have about sexuality and relationships and that their parents had signed permission slips that allowed me to talk to them and allowed me to um, answer questions that they have. There was there kind of as a stunned silence. Um, for a little while and then one of the young men said to me how do you keep a relationship fresh fresh and explain breast milk that really was not what I thought I'd be hearing but what that taught me is they want to know anything and everything and you have to answer whatever question they have and they don't get a lot of information from good sources which is over a lot of the time Okay, so what we're, what we're going to talk today about is four common problems that um, I experienced when teaching this group of kids. And I'm going to explain a little bit about Mike's crush. Um, because I was um, concerned about the lack of teaching materials that were appropriate and respectful when you talk about these issues with middle and high school students, um, I've made, I've, my son and I made a video that models um, the wrong way to do things and the right way to do things. And it's called Mike's Crush. And then I've written a curriculum that goes with it with lessons and other things that you can use. Now, the way that the curriculum is set up is that 
there's one one scenario one um, scenario of what's happening with Mike who has the crush and in the the bad day scenario goes on for it's about seven eight nine minutes long and then the, they do it the right way so you take the same actors, the same scenario, the same situations, and you show that we showed them in a, in a not a good way, over the top way, where he's really stalking this girl and he's just doing a lot of things that were absolutely not okay. And then the same people did the, the second scenario where they, they did things correctly. When you're working with teenagers, they get really bored if you just show them the right way to do things. And I really felt it engaged them a lot so they could. They could see what Mike was doing wrong. They're always being told what they're doing wrong. Well, now they can see what Mike's doing wrong, and they can identify. Um, the other thing is that what we I could control the content. So I had all the feedback from um, coming from his peers about what he was doing right and wrong. We were able to get close-up shots of facial expressions. We were able to use body language in specific ways to help um, be part of the teaching um, material that we developed. The four common problems we're talking about is identifying the types of relationship, boundaries, hanging out, and stalking or a crush. So the first common problem I run into is that people do not understand the different types of relationships. The first thing I do with any class I teach, middle or high school, the very first day I walk in the classroom and say, hi, my name's Miss Noel. Am I a friend or am I a stranger? And most of you, if you work with people with disabilities, are pretty clear that they answer, I'm their friend. But they've never met me before. Then I asked them, what is a stranger? And the things that they told me were, were just amazing. Um, strangers are bad people. Strangers don't get in their car. Don't let them in the house. They're going to hurt you. They have guns. So that's not good because what it means is the two most basic types of relationships that people have is with friends or strangers they don't even really understand what what a friend is or what a stranger is that is where I start with every single group that I teach I have to be sure that they understand what a friend is how they know they have a friend what a stranger is not all strangers are bad they're good strangers like doctors and ambulance drivers they're also bad strangers I also use the word acquaintance, which is something, a person kind of in the middle. It's a big word for a lot of the kids, but it really does describe the middle ground. And I use um, hand signals to help them remember that. We talk about family and we talk about community helpers. I do not talk about boyfriends and girlfriends until I know that they really understand who fits into each of those categories. The, the Dibble website has a sample of the video on it for this lesson. I would encourage you to go and take a look at it. Um, it's shot in high def. We have professional actors. Um, the, the screen, the script was written by a um, a young man who has a brother who has Asperger's by accident. And we really tried to do this in a very professional way. And uh, most people are pretty impressed with the quality of video. To go along with that is this is how the lessons kind of lay out. Um, I show the good day and the bad day videos so they can see the whole thing um, and they know kind of what the storyline is. For each lesson then we have vocabulary words that they really have to understand. It is amazing how many words that these students really don't know what they mean. Particularly words that they hear all you know around with other kids um, and they say words and they really don't know what they mean. So then we pair the good day version and the bad day version of one piece of the video. And, and this one is particularly around how to identify different kinds of relationships. How to, how to um, is this person a friend, is this person a stranger? Um, and then go out in the community and in different environments and be able to, to identify the relationships. I actually did the lesson this morning with a group of kids and I put on um, the video a video that taught that was not Mike's crush and showed a number of people in many different situations and they had to identify what what uh, group they were in. Um, the curriculum has worksheets, it has pre and post tests and it has a quiz. Um, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. So this is how I teach relationship skills or understanding relationship, different types of relationships. Another thing we do is play, play charades. 
with the kids that have more abilities, I have them watch TV shows or movies, and they have to tell me what the relationships are with the people in the TV and the movies and, and how they know. When they get good at that, I turn the sound off to see if they can figure this out with, with just body language, with just facial expressions, which is really hard. Um, I ask the teachers to have them observe people around the school and the community and, and practice doing that. Depending on, you know, this is very easy for some kids, they really do get this, but other kids it takes a while for them to learn. Um, for students that have less abilities, we do role playing, um, different kinds of relationships, what you do when you're in a, a stranger situation or what you do when you're a friend. With some of the kids we make actual visual images of their room at home, their, their family members at home, of their friends in the classroom, and then other strangers and other people so they can really look at exact images of what we're talking about. Often this they have to be uh, reminded we have to revisit this issue over time. Another thing that I teach is how to make friends and that really is important before you can really figure out how to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend which is what they all want to do. So we talk about, uh, many, many people do this, speech therapists do this, so there's social, social groups, a lot of people are working on this, but it really is important. Um, we practice conversation skills, we practice, we've been working on recently is giving compliments to people as a way to open up a conversation. One of the things that on a video that I was using, another video, in that video a guy had a crush on a girl and he said, oh, your hair looks really nice, did you get a cut? Well, I have to be careful about that because boys don't usually say that kind of things to girls and a lot of the kids I'm teaching take things very literally. So I give them the language. So I'm teaching the boys to say, you look really nice today and that, did you get your hair cut? I like that blouse. Where would you get those shoes? That's really a language that more girls would talk to girls and I really want them to be able to get the way they interact with people correct um, if I'm we're helping them figure out what to do. One of the most important things that I teach is it, what does it look like if someone is not interested in being your friend or girlfriend or boyfriend? That's when we get into stalking, that's when we get into serious issues, that's when um, kids start talking about them um, when they're in uh, included classrooms. So one of the, the groups I was working with, um, one of the students, the girl students came in and she said, I said, is there anything you want to talk about? Yeah, all the kids in my history class are picking on me and I want them to stop. As we talked about it, it became pretty clear that she had a crush on one of the boys in the class, that he was not interested in her, um, that he had told her he's not interested, her, her peers that were in the group with me had told her he's not interested, the teachers had told him told her he's not interested and she kept pursuing him. So it was really a little more complicated than the peers in her history class were making fun of her. She was really putting herself in a situation that was um, not good and the net result was that the kids in the class were making fun with, of her and doing things that were really not very nice. Okay, every kid wants me to help them get a boyfriend or a girlfriend tomorrow. Um, and this is really hard, I have to say. Um, after I feel that the kids have, and, or as they get older, when we deal, we start dealing with romantic relationships. And what are romantic relationships like? Um, what is flirting? How do you flirt? How can you tell if someone's flirting with you? How do you ask someone out on a date? What do you do on a date? Um, and we talk about all those pieces of it. And the other things that we spend a lot of time on is what is the hidden language that people use when they're communicating things? Like if you ask a girl to a prom and they say, um, let me think about it, well, what it really means is, um, I, let me see if I can get a better date and if I can't get a better date then I'll go with you. But the guys have no way of knowing that. Um, a guy was asking a girl out for a date and she said she was always busy. Well, she wasn't always busy. She was blown, you know, she didn't want to go out with him. But he was taking her very literally and had a hard time. Okay, common problem, boundaries. Um, boundaries Nancy, would you really like important. me to do the poll? Would you like me to launch the poll on boundaries? Oh, yes. 
Okay, Thank let me you. launch that. You're welcome. So here's a poll. Understanding boundaries are a necessary part of our learning relationship skills, and you can select no, they only need to learn about personal space. Yes, it helps keep them safe. Yes, boundaries help keep people from getting arrested. And no, making friends doesn't involve understanding boundaries. So we're up to watching them come in. By the way, there's 49 people attending our webinar today. So almost, actually there were 50 for a bit. And Okay, let me close this poll and show it to you. So um, everyone says it helps keep students safe with teen relationships. And the next most popular one was, yes, boundaries keep people from getting arrested. And for a big tie at three is they only need to learn about personal space and making friends doesn't involve boundaries. Mm -hmm. Well, I would all agree with you all. Learning boundaries help keep, help, really helps keep them safe. and. Um, and there are risks. And boundaries do keep them from getting arrested. That's absolutely critical. So my view of personal space is that personal space has been, these kids have been taught personal space for many, many years um, by the time they get in middle school and high school. And I think there are many other types of boundaries that are really critical that they understand. And not understanding those boundaries really do put them at risk for sexual abuse or having problematic sexual behavior. These are the other boundaries that I teach. So I really, I spend a little bit of time on personal space, but not a lot. People need to go, they need to understand public and private, which I describe public and private is the only private place in the world is your bathroom at home and your bedroom at home because we've run into significant problems with masturbating in places that were not private. Um, emotional boundaries, um, I have a couple kids that blurt a lot in terms of informational boundaries, if they think it, it comes out of their mouth, and relationship boundaries. I had two kids that were uh, assigned to work um, in an elementary school cleaning up the cafeteria. And after they got done their work, they decided they wanted to go make out. Well, they went to make out in the girls' room, in a stall, in the elementary school girls' room. They don't really get boundaries if they decide they want to make out in the elementary school girls' bathroom. It was a big mess, and they got fired, and we talked more and more about boundaries. Um, another thing I teach is just another kinds of boundaries are decision-making and safety. Um, I talk about urinal protocols, bathroom safety, um, who you can touch, who you can't touch, when you can touch them. I've had a recent two situations this, uh, recently where a student told their mother they were getting in the car. She was in 10th grade with a 12th grader, and he was going to drive her, and they were going to go to the library when they really went over to his house. And he didn't rape her this time, and I'm hoping that she doesn't do it again. One, another extreme of not understand boundaries was a kid with Asperger's who usually had um, bowel movements at home, but he really he wasn't able to do that on a particular day. And when he has bowel movements, he takes off all of his clothes, all of his clothes. So he went into the bathroom right outside the cafeteria and took all of his clothes off. Fortunately, a young man that was not going to do something awful saw what was happening and went and told. Um, guys counselor the teachers and they were able to get him out of there and explain the situation and he really you know he just didn't have that information it never occurred to him that you wouldn't do the same thing at school that you do at home so these are these are really safety issues around boundaries boundaries are really hard to teach um, we talk a lot is how old are you when you sit on your mother's lap who you can kiss where can you kiss them who can you hug and I've had um, Teachers asked me to deal with a, a family where the 15-year-old son was getting in bed with his parents in the morning and that that really was probably not a good idea. Um, we were able to talk about it and the mom reported that she took our suggestions and things were going better. I teach kids that you must ask before you touch. That is the only way they can know for sure that someone wants to be touched because they're not good at reading the other signals. 
I believe that your whole body is private, not just the parts where you have a bathing suit because you really can't go up to someone and, and touch their hair or rub their shoulder or, or touch their leg. You, you really can't do that because people's bodies are private. Uh, a sex educator that um, I know had run a six-week sex education class and people had attended. These were adults and he was going, he went to the class and he learned everything. He got on the bus on Monday morning to go to work in the summer. And he sat out on the bus and he sat down next to a really pretty young woman and he put his thigh, hand on her thigh. Now, as the police dragged him off the bus, he said, but that is not a private part of her body. I believe that we blew that. We blew that by having him believe that he could touch other parts of a person's body. Okay, this is a question to be polled. Is understanding, oh, we did that already. Okay, I did at the end. So it is, you got it right. All right, hanging out. Now we have a question about hanging out. Should we put that up? I don't know that I, I don't have a, a question on it. You just want to ask it, Nancy, and we can sure. have them raise their hands? Well, okay. Um, teaching high school students how to hang out is important. Um, it is important to teach them using many small steps. They should have their siblings make plans for them. They need to learn how to go to the movies by themselves, and they need to invite friends, know how to invite friends over to their house. So it's A, B, C, and D. Oh, so we, so I'm sorry, we don't have the yeah. ability to do a poll, so we're going to just have to, you need to answer, answer a yes or no question and have people hand, raise their hands if they think it's right. I can't. Okay. I can't so. do anything else. Is it very important to teach high school students how to hang out with their peers? That's, there you go. That is a yes or no. Question. Raise your hand if you think teaching kids just the hanging out process is important. And let me see what they're saying. Oh. Yep, most everybody believes that teaching kids to hang out, even though you would think they would, that would just come, you know, you wouldn't have to teach it, but with this population, um, the majority of people on this webinar believe you do need to teach how to hang out. Yeah, and I, it took me a long time to figure that out because I just assumed they had each other's phone numbers, they got together outside of school. When I realized the kids were graduating and they had no ability to get in touch with their friends after they graduated and were then going to be possibly in a world that was pretty isolated without the skills to do that, um, that's when I decided to start teaching kids how to hang out. Now. This is hard because some parents, you know, think it's important, other people don't. But the facts are, they're too old for playdates. They really are. Um, they can learn how to make phone calls. They can learn how to invite people over their house. They can learn how to do the planning um, to teach people so that they can hang out with their friends. I just put this little list together, and that's this is not anywhere close to a comprehensive list of all the things that the kids need to learn. Um, they don't really talk, sometimes they talk on the phone, well sometimes they don't. A lot of my kids are texting, so you got to use all the new technology also when you're teaching. Um, it's easier to have them invite people over to their house to watch a movie and have pizza first. The plans necessary to have a group of kids go to the movies is much more complicated. So we do these steps a little bit at the time, but I think this is really incredible. Is incredibly important for them to be able to um, maintain relationships and friendships over time. Stalking. So this is one study that reflects people that are on the spectrum, and what they found is they have more inappropriate courting behaviors, focusing attention on celebrities, strangers, colleagues, and pursuing targets for longer length of time. Stalking is a real issue for kids on the spectrum. And the other group of people I've run into are, um, because I teach in so many places, is girls with Down syndrome. I have quite a few girls with Down syndrome that are stalking and, and stalking a lot. What I teach people is a, a crush. You legitimize their feelings. You have a crush on someone and that's an okay thing to have. Um, but the feelings are only going in one direction. The other person does not feel the same way about you that you feel about them. And because of that, you, they're not going to be your girlfriend, and I'm pretty, pretty blunt with them um, about that and helping them to 
really understand the limits of, of a relationship. Um, we also talk about how relationships can change over time, which is hard for some kids. That they can start out being acquaint a stranger, acquaintance to a friend, and then possibly to a girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, these are the things that I see kids doing with stalking. And I see a wide range of things happening with a wide range of, range of ages. One of the most serious situations I was involved with was um, a middle school student on the spectrum. And he, he just he wasn't except he just couldn't figure out what we were trying to say to him. And he, because he was right, as some personality of some people in the spectrum. And in that summer of middle school, he was thrown out of one summer camp, and the police were called at the next summer camp. And he, he followed a girl home. He was making lists of girls he thought was beautiful and giving them to him. Um, he was just doing a lot of really, really off-the-wall stuff that was really upsetting parents. Um, even though he had disability, they had a right to be upset. So lessons that I talked about um, in terms of stalking or crush. Um, I want them to identify problematic sexual behavior. You must ask before you touch someone. And vocabulary is so important. I had this wonderful student who had a crush on a girl, and he went around telling people he wanted to rape her. He did not know what the word rape meant. So every year I have a class where they're just allowed to say all the bad words because I want them to know what it means. And they're not allowed to use any words that they do not know what they mean. Not they don't always listen, but it's a good place to start. I teach rules and laws. If they're going to get in trouble, they need to know what the rules are, what the laws are, and how, and what is involved in breaking them. Um, for stalking, I, I want, I teach them the rules and laws about that immediately. I, we address it pretty quickly. I believe students need consequences for their behavior, and they don't. It, Excuses are not helpful. I already told you a story about the jail. But because if you don't, if, if these issues are not handled um, quickly and seriously, I have a, a girl that's been stalking this one boy for five years, and we, we from middle school all the way through high school, and we haven't been able to get her to stop. So we can do this work. Um, the work, I have to say, the work is hard. Um, but I love it, and parents really appreciate um, spending time and, and working these things through with their kids. I, I really want people to go out on dates when they're in high school, when there's a safety net of teachers and family and friends around them. I have worked with the adults that never had these experiences, and they start going out on dates when they're 30 and 40 years old, and they do get in a lot of trouble because they just don't know how to do this. And it can be um, a real significant problem and can put them at risk. I believe we can talk about these issues even though they may embar be embarrassing and difficult. And um, this really applies to a lot of kids with intellectual disabilities. But I have to say, I do believe the kids that are on the spectrum are higher risk in terms of um, getting arrested or having serious problems um, with problematic sexual behavior. But they all need to learn how to do healthy relationships and they all need to feel good about themselves. And I believe quality of life includes healthy, intimate, and safe relationships. And we're done. So um, before we, uh, why don't you back up one there, Nancy? OK. We'll ask if anyone has any questions. Sure. So you can write your questions in on the little, on your box. Or Irene, you, you're better at this. Yeah, you can put them in the uh, question box uh, or any comments that you may have for Nancy. Uh, Nancy, can you explain a little bit about how you, uh, what is your organization like? like where do you teach? How do you? Uh, where do you actually do your teaching? Mm -hmm. um, I live in the Philadelphia area, and I contract with five school districts, and I teach in uh, middle and high schools um, once or twice a month 
for an hour each class and I this year I'm teaching around 115 students um, spread across and I'm in about 25 30 classrooms um, and I have a huge range of, of abilities of students um, types of disabilities and um, so you can teach the same content so you have to adapt it in many many ways many many uh, times so that, that they get it the teachers are fabulous and the administrators in the I, I, I have not advertised the teachers have found me the administrators have found me and because of that they're incredibly supportive of the work that we do I do one of the most important things I do because I didn't talk a lot about sexuality issues but um, there are sexuality issues that come up and I do teach about puberty and all that and to have it, some help and advice about that they find quite um, quite helpful Nancy we have a question from Lori McDonald mm -hmm. who asks if you are suspicious that a student has experienced sexual abuse what is the best way to determine if they have been sexually abused hmm. um, that's a little tricky because different laws have different I mean different states have different laws um, so if you're in a school district they probably know what the local law is um, in the in our area the Pennsylvania laws are pretty in the middle New York is very restrictive and New Jersey is kind of um, more liberal so you do have to know that people I've done interviews to determine that, but you really need to have someone that knows how to do that so you're not giving the person information that, that can discredit what they're saying. Um, so I would prefer that you find someone at a rape crisis center or someone in the police department that may be trained to do these kind of interviews or, or a guidance counselor, someone in the school. Because it's um, you, if a kid does say yes, you don't want them discredited by the questions that you're asking or how you are doing the interview. So your suggestion um, is to get an expert in the area to help right. the, the person. Here's another question. Like, how, mm -hmm. how prevalent is this type of teaching in the public school system? Specifically, do you know of any teachers like you in the Dallas, Texas area? Or are there lists of um, sexuality educators who are working with special populations? Um, I do have a colleague that's in Austin. Um, she doesn't teach in the schools quite the way I do, but she's um, she's pretty amazing. Um, I don't know many people that do what I do. Um, I ended up coming from the disability world and learning about the sexuality education. Um, I went to Widener University um, in the Philadelphia area, and it was one of, uh, until recently, the only accredited um, doctoral program in sexuality education in the world. Um, so th there are not a lot of programs that teach sexuality education and fewer people that um, that actually combine those two things. I think it's happening more and more and one of my personal goals is to teach people how to do this um, because I think the need is incredibly important. Okay, another question is how do you check for understanding of vocabulary words with nonverbal autistic students. This comes from Truckee, California. So how do you check for um, understanding a of a lot of what right. right. You know, it's interesting because I'm pretty popular because I don't give tests, I don't give quizzes, I don't give homework, and I get to, then they get to talk about girlfriends and boyfriends. So I'm kinda up there with a gym teacher, but I don't use always um, real mechanism to assess their knowledge. Often what I do is when we're talking about something, I said, okay, tell me what we just talked about. Tell me what we just said. Tell me what we just heard. And you'll be surprised how little they got. So you really have to be cautious. And I think your question is right on. You have to check all the time um, to make sure that they understand the language that they're using. Um, and if they don't get it, then we go over it again. So someone has asked about um, what training is required and where you can get sample lessons. And I will uh, say that the sample lessons, uh, sample lesson, a link to the video that Nancy described and information about the curricula is at dibbleinstitute.org. And uh, one of our helpful uh, people wrote in that um, if you're, you know, the way, the best way to get this kind of material in your school se setting is to get the program and start teaching it. And you can be the first. Uh, Nancy, I have another uh, question. When talking mm -hmm. about stalking, 
there was research by Stokes, sure. et cetera. What was the title of this research and where can I find it? So, um, oh, I stole that from Peter Gerhardt's I... talk. Do you know Peter Gerhardt? Peter Gerhardt is, uh, oh, that's not true. I can't remember where I found that. If I find it, I will send it over to Dibble because I, I, I look in many places. I can't remember where I got that. If you um, have I not subscribed to the Dibble email list, please go to our website and subscribe. And then when Nancy sends that information, we'll send it out in our next monthly newsletter. Um, well, or we also, could go back to the slide and they could look at the quote. Right. And, you know, the other thing is it will be, uh, if it's typed in, it will be on our report and we will have the person who asked the question and we will send you a direct email with the answer. Okay. That's a good idea. So a, a facts good. teacher, a family and consumer sciences teacher is writing in. Hello, hello. Um, she teaches relationships, and she asks, how do you teach students who are not on the spectrum not to abuse those on the spectrum, that it is illegal and it crosses boundaries? That's an interesting question. Hmm. It's really hard because um, what I've seen in the schools is it cuts both ways. I've seen kids that are non-disabled, typical kids being very kind and very supportive, and the kids misread that as boyfriend-girlfriend relationships. Um, but then there are times when it, that's not true. Um, um, there are a lot. There are teaching materials out there that um, are available to teach non-disabled students about disabilities. Um, the one place I'm thinking of that does this in terms of autism is the Coulter Institute, the Coulter videos or Coulter films, and um, they've created a number of films that really kind of teach what, particularly what autism is all about. Um, I, there may be something about Down syndrome if you do that specifically, if you look it up. Right. But other people have made curricula to do that. Uh, another person asks, Lauren Smith asks, how do you, how can you help young adults in when they need to change their boundaries? Um, oh, I see. And she's saying, for instance, allowing young men to dictate someone else's happiness. So being coerced or being, um, you know, how do they stick to their guns? Mm hmm Actually, I just, I did a lesson on that just today. Um, I do find um, regular ed resources, and I have to say to everyone, I've bought Dibble materials before and adapted them to the, to the kids that I teach. I think their materials are excellent. Um, often, I'll try to find a movie and, and use the video and not the, the curricula that comes with it. Um, and I think... Um, Movies help because it really illustrates what you're talking about. Um, this one I used today was 10, si 10 Signs of Sexual Abuse, and it was put out by HMR, Human Resources Media. Human Resources Media. Media. Right. It was a bit heavy for the, the group of kids that I was teaching today. I had to adapt it, but, but they do have a decent amount of materials. Um, that I that I think are excellent. So, the, did we answer the question? Does I got, Dibble have anything like that for teaching? So, what's the question? I'm sorry. What does Dibble have anything that? I'm sorry. I was doing something else. Do you have anything that does that teaches that, Irene? Personal boundaries. Personal boundaries. We do, you know, uh, either the um, healthy choices, healthy relationships as boundary education. And in all relationship education, uh, there are boundary issues that are addressed. Uh, in fact, that's probably a, one of the positive, one of the many positive outcomes of healthy relationship education is building empathy. Uh, with uh, children, uh, helping teens get that idea of empathy, and then um, also the boundaries and uh, looking at what are boundaries and what are healthy boundaries. Um, so there's a lot there, and I know a lot of the teachers uh, will stop at the booth and say, do you have something on that? And they are typically transferring it, adapting it to um, 
that they work with special needs students as well. You just have to be very concrete. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, usually the special needs teachers know just how to, uh, you know, uh, bring it down to simpler terms for them. Okay, well those help. are all our questions. Okay, well Nancy, thank you so much for your information today. And I think all of us have a special appreciation for uh, those who uh, go and teach relationship skills or teach special needs students, whether it's relationship skills or any of our uh, education material on the day to day. So you're very much appreciated, and so is your experience. Thank you again for joining us today, wow. and we look forward to keeping in touch with you. Um, and we have several ways that we can, and if Nancy would please forward our um, our slides, thank you very much. Um, if you go to our Dibble website at www.dibbleinstitute.org, we have you can join our e-newsletter, which offers a lot of uh, monthly information on research findings, new um, new and updated resources, funding opportunities, both private and government sources and uh, just general updates on anything relating to young adult education, our relationship education. We also invite you to like us on our Facebook page and to follow us on LinkedIn. And uh, you can find, as was mentioned, that we do have sample lessons and the videos. I think if you were to look at those videos, you would connect what Nancy is talking about on how we can make and turn around Mike's bad day into a good day. Uh, and any questions that may come to mind after this broadcast may be sent to us at either myself or Kathy, Irene at DibbleInstitute.org, or Kathy at DibbleInstitute.org, and we'll be happy to address those questions. And any order made within 30 days of this live broadcast is eligible for free shipping, which is a 10% saving. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website as well if you want to revisit it or um, pass it on to another viewer. And I, Irene, let me just interrupt you and say.